Hi, this is Rob, your chemistry teacher, and this is the first ever chemistry podcast. What we're going to do today is talk through a key subject, electronegativity, polarity, and intermolecular bonding. Now, you might recognize the PowerPoint slides that are in front of you. Those are the ones that I've used in lesson, and they're also the ones available on Moodle. So, away we go. Okay, so what you see in front of you is a picture of a dot and cross diagram of HCl, that's hydrochloric acid. Now, as you can see, two of the electrons there are being shared. One has come from the hydrogen and one has come from the chlorine. So both atoms could be viewed as having a complete outer shell. Now, of course, it doesn't quite work like that because electrons aren't stationary. So what that pair of electrons are going to do is spend some time around the hydrogen and some time around the chlorine. And ultimately... What will, what will cause interesting things to happen is whether that pair of electrons spend more time around one than the other. So, the important thing to remember here is that electrons have a negative charge. And if those electrons are spending more time around one atom than the other, then that atom itself will have an overall negative charge. Really important. Now, the key thing is, is chlorine is much bigger. It's much more electric negative than the hydrogen so it's going to spend a the electrons are going to spend a lot more time around the chlorine than the hydrogen resulting in that chlorine having an overall negative charge and that negative charge will stay there very very occasionally the hydrogen will have it but if we were to monitor that HCl over the space of about 10 minutes it will be about 0.1 second on the hydrogen the rest of the time on the chlorine okay the, the key to a molecule having a, an overall charge or a charge as in one particular area is electronegativity. Now electronegativity is the ability of an atom to attract electrons towards themselves and ultimately the, what causes different atoms to have different electronegativities are the number of protons and the amount of shielding that's involved. Now the little image that you can see in front of you there is a version of the periodic table which shows which elements are the most electronegative and a good rule if you go to the right and if you go to the top you will get the more electronegative elements fluorine of course being the most electronegative so this is a really key point now in terms of what causes polarity because if you have two elements bonded together for example hydrogen and chlorine if you have a big difference in electronegativity between those two elements then you will get polarity because the pair of electrons in that bond will spend more time around the more the most electronegative. The key things to look out for are if you get lone pairs of electrons because lone pairs of electrons are always going to be negative and they will create areas of negativity across molecules causing polarity. If you get a symmetrical distribution of charge around a molecule, for example methane, then you end up with no overall polarity. Now, really key point here, because this is one of the things that intermolecular bonds really hinges on, and it's always worth mentioning if you get this in a, as an exam question, and it's all to do with boiling and melting points. When you are boiling something, or when you are melting something, you are breaking the intermolecular bonds. It's as simple as that. Okay, So something will not boil or will not melt unless the intermolecular bonds have been broken. And in order to break those bonds, you need energy. The stronger the intermolecular bonds, the more energy is required to break those intermolecular bonds. It's as simple as that. And if this comes up in an exam and they love it, they always ask this, there's a, it, there's an extremely high chance of it, it's worth talking about using energy to break intermolecular bonds. Stronger intermolecular bonds, more energy, weaker intermolecular bonds, less energy. And later on we'll look at the different types of intermolecular bonds and what how much energy is required to break them. Okay, so now thinking about boiling and melting points and when you've got polarity there, if you have polarity, you must have regions of positive charge and you must have regions of negative charge. You cannot have polarity and just have negative charge and you cannot have polarity and just have positive charge. You must have opposite charges present amongst different molecules. Now, what do opposite charges do? Well, they attract. So if you have positive regions and negative regions, they will be attracted to each other. And it's the attraction between that positive and that negative that causes intermolecular bonds to form. So as a rule, when you have polar molecules, because you have those regions of negative and positive being attracted to each other, yeah, yeah, it's going to take more energy to break that 
Okay, polar molecules, those regions of charge tend to be stronger and they are there all of the time. So as a result, it's going to take a lot more energy to overcome that. And if you think every molecule has a bit of charge in either side of it, then every molecule is capable of forming a relatively strong intermolecular bond. So what we've got here is a diagram, again sticking to this HCl idea, to show how we can represent polarity in a visual form. And as you can see, our chlorine has got a negative charge, our hydrogen has got a positive charge, and we use the delta symbol to show charge. And that delta symbol is absolutely key. If you forget to use that, you will lose the mark in the exam. You won't get the credit for it. Now you can see the pair of electrons that are being shared are depicted. They're on the right-hand side of the chlorine. That's where they tend to spend more of their time. And they're attracted to the positively charged hydrogen. Now, just uh, to recap, if you do get an overall sym symmetry across that molecule, then there will be no overall charge. Uh, CCl4, that's tetrachloromethane, is a classic example of that. Carbon dioxide is another good example of a molecule that has no overall charge. So, what we've got here is some data, and it's the data showing the boiling points, sorry, the melting points of the Nobel gases. And you can see there's a massive difference between helium and radon. Now, the Nobel gases are boring, they don't do anything, they're really completely uninteresting. Now, thinking it from that point of view, we shouldn't really see, expect to see any difference, but we do, and that implies that some kind of intermolecular bonding is going on even with the Nobel gases, and it must have something to do with the size of the atoms as that's the only thing that changes. Now to demonstrate this point it's easier to think about chlorine, bizarrely enough. Chlorine's a good example because two chlorines joined together, Cl2, they both have the same amount of electronegativity. But those electrons, again, are not stationary. They are whizzing round, they're spending time around both chlorines. And of course when those pair of electrons just happen to be around one chlorine, there will be a negative charge there, just for an instant. So it's known as an instantaneous dipole. If there's a negative on one side, there will be a positive on the other side. Now, that instant area of negativity will induce a dipole in a neighbouring molecule. Okay, So they'll, it will push any electrons away, resulting in an instant positive charge and... Uh, then you can going to get a difference between positive and negative, which is going to attract those two molecules together, resulting in an instantaneous dipole, also known as van der Waals forces. Much easier to remember it as van der Waals forces. Just there, a little summary about which one is stronger than the other. So if we apply back to the Nobel gases, what we've just thought about as far as CO2s, the only difference is, is the size of the atoms. Radon is a much bigger atom than helium, and as a result it has a lot more electrons. It's got shed loads of them, and it's electrons that are responsible for this charge. So if the electrons spend more time around one side of a radon atom, less time around the side of the other, you're going to get more negative and a more positive region, therefore instantaneous dipole. OK, so we're going to finish with one last type of intermolecular bonding. Now, it is an extremely important type of intermolecular bonding known as hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding only occurs when you've got oxygen and hydrogens bonded together or nitrogen and hydrogens bonded together. Now, this, this type of intermolecular bonding uh, occurs as a result of lone pairs of electrons, for example, on the oxygen or the nitrogen, and differences in electronegativity between the oxygen and hydrogen, or between the hi nitrogen and the hydrogen, resulting in a positive charge on the hydrogen and a strong negative charge on the oxygen. There is a diagram, and that's how to do it. That's what they're asked, they'll ask for. It's very common for them to ask for this type of diagram in an exam. You notice your delta positives on your hydrogen, delta negatives on your oxygen. Good practice to put lone pairs of electrons in there and the hydrogen bonds between the oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. You notice that is a roughly a straight line. There are some uh, key there are some key thing, things about hydrogen bonding that you're expected to recall in the exam. One is why is ice less dense than water, and it's just basically as water solidifies, the molecules line up to form a lattice, and it's the actual hydrogen bonds that hold them apart. The other one that you need to know is that water has a much higher boiling point than you would initially expect, and as a result, that causes uh, uh, that means it takes a lot more energy to break those hydrogen bonds. 
that's that's again it's a classic exam uh, type of question is to try and recall those things another important thing about hygiene bonding okay just one last point that without uh, hygiene bonding DNA double helix wouldn't be held together so DNA wouldn't really work without hygiene bonding now what we'll just finish on is just thinking about the different types of intermolecular bonding we've looked at and their relative strengths strongest one is hydrogen bonding. It takes more energy to break hydrogen bond than any other intermolecular bond. Then you've got permanent to permanent dipoles and finally the weakest one is van der Waals forces. Of course it's worth bearing in mind that covalent and ionic bonds are both significantly stronger than the the types of intermolecular bonding. So that's it for the first ever chemistry podcast. Hope it was some use to you. Thanks very much for listening. Bye bye.